If you're wondering why we've parked three dual cabs in a dry creek bed, we're on a 2,500 kilometer trip to find out whether the GWM Ute has what it takes to beat default dual cabs like a Toyota Hilux and an Isuzu D-Max. Now, the appeal, the massive part of the appeal of the GWM Ute is its price. Here we have a top spec Canon X it's $44,490 drive away, and that's after price rises over the last couple of months. Whereas the equivalent Hilux over there, the Rogue, is $70,000, and the LSU D-Max we've got here, which is only an upper mid-spec car, is $59,500. And those two prices aren't drive away. If you wanted to buy the cheapest dual cab Hilux without a cab chassis on the back, you're looking at a $49,500 workmate with a 2.4 diesel and absolute stripper spec, which is still $5,000 more than that, and that's drive away. And in the Isuzu's case, you're looking at just under $51,000 for an MY22 SX, again, dual cab, both of those cars being automatic, and that's whatever the maths is there to $51,000, and again, that's not drive away. So there is a extremely persuasive argument to buying this Chinese made Great Wall Motors Ute. But we're not just here to test prices on a spec sheet. We're here to see whether not only the GWM Ute, but also the Hilux and the D-Max can handle what Australia can throw at it. And as it turns out, it's quite a lot. We've driven from Sydney out through Goulburn, out to Ivanhoe. We did 200 kilometers on an extremely challenging dirt road, the Mosgiel Road, out to Menindee, the back way into Broken Hill, and now we're at the back of Broken Hill, right on the cusp of the outback. These cars have not been treated kindly, but they're still working for now. Parked in front of the other two dual cabs, it's pretty obvious that the GWM Ute is quite imposing, but it is a big dual cab. It's definitively bigger than these other two here. It's 150 millimeters longer than the D-Max, and it has a wheelbase that's about 100 millimeters longer in general, yet it doesn't actually weigh any more than the other two. It's about 50 kilos lighter than the Hilux, and it's very slightly heavier than the D-Max. So we kind of pretty much have an apples for apples situation where it doesn't quite meet the other two and where you are paying less for less is what's under the bonnet here. We've got a two liter turbo diesel in this car with only 120 kilowatts. We've got 140 kilowatts in the D-Max and 150 kilowatts in the Hilux. But more importantly is the torque, 400 Newton meters versus 450 Newton meters versus 500 Newton meters. So can the eight speed automatic that the GWM has make up for that on the road or indeed getting out of this creek bed? That's what we're here to find out. Now there's a couple of things you need to pay attention to in the GWM before you take off. And one of them is the lane keep assist. Now, before I do that, I'll mention how it drives in a corner because we've got a lovely big corner here. And this car is really, oh, it, it, yeah. The steering does fight against cambers in the road. It's mostly about comfort. This car prefers to go in a straight line, which is why the lane keep assist is kind of a little bit annoying in that it's quite amateur in that it doesn't have any subtlety. It can be quite insistent in nudging you away from the line and it even works when towing and when you're driving along ruts on dirt roads where you just don't need it. You push the car button there and you turn it off because it is obstructive to the way the car drives and the other one is the steering assist. Now we are already in steering light and so going through that corner back there where the steering's loading up in a corner it um you can imagine what it's like in normal and then in sport. It's just too much. It needs a retune of the EPS. Aside from that though, the GWM is actually quite a comfortable car to drive. You sit down deep in these seats, although this black interior really soaks up the heat in the outback here. It gets extremely hot and the air conditioning system, which is again a little bit annoying in the way that you've got to go through all these fiddly systems to try and get to it is not quite up to the task of keeping this interior as chilled as it is in Japanese dual cabs, all of which usually always have outstanding air conditioning. Now, the GWM also rides really quite well to an extent. It has, it has a little bit of knobbliness about it. It does flash its hazards on when you hit the brakes quite quickly, which is nice because 
that works really well on dirt roads when you're warning people that something big is coming. But it just needs a retune. I feel like its first point of defense, which is its front suspension, is fine until it hits a really big bump and then it just doesn't have their compression damping to stop that. Here we are on dirt. Where it kind of works quite well as on dirt is because much like sort of like an HQ Holden of a very long time ago, the sort of the understeer bias and that sort of stodge in the dynamics of this car work well on dirt because it makes it safe. And the ESC system, which has been tuned by someone who didn't do the lane keep assist, is actually really capable in just nibbling away at the edges, stopping it from sliding around corners, just keeping it tidy and together. If only that front suspension was meaty enough to be able to f sort of combine oh, with the rest of the car. As you'll see in some of the videos we've done of this thing, like it really does launch and it does take a little bit to sort of settle down again. The thing about that is that it's not that it's necessarily massively under damped, it just doesn't have that initial compression damping to stop it from then sort of kind of bouncing up and down a bit. It does mean you need to slow down in bits where you wouldn't otherwise because the rest of the chassis is planted and the feeling of being in this car is really comfortable. So for the most part, the GWM does a really good job in Outback stuff, but it's just one dedicated retune of the suspension by the factory or a really good set of aftermarket springs and dampers away from being truly attuned to Australian conditions. So aside from the multimedia system in this car that can look quite slick when Apple CarPlay is working because it doesn't always do that faultlessly. This, I think, is just to look pretty in a showroom. Compared to the two Japanese utes we have here that are sturdy and simple, certainly the Hilux is. The D-Max, not so much. It has its own issues with its screen. It's just too over complex for a car that requires your attention on dirt roads like this and is about being a workhorse at the end of the day. This is too much. The other is the engine. The engine in the GWM is actually quite sweet on its own. It's quite refined and it skips along nicely and it uses its torque reasonably well, but it just doesn't have enough of all of that stuff. It's only got 400 Newton meters, whereas the Hilux has 500. And I know the Hilux is a bit heavier and this has eight gears and the Hilux only has six. It's just not quite enough. In isolation, fine. Compared to the other two, you can see where the GWM is working quite hard, particularly when it's in like creek beds and stuff like that, oh, where it relies on that torque. You really have to drive it in manual mode to mean that it's staying in a low gear because it just wants to keep shifting up even when it's in sport. It's just not quite there. It needs a chip or another turbo or another 500 cc's and then it'd be really good because mostly the transmission is great. The first thing you notice about driving the D-Max compared to the GWM is just how small it feels. It's really quite narrow compared to the GWM. Uh, it also feels quite high. You don't have that massive shelf of a bonnet looking out over the top. You've just got a nice slope down to those little fangs it's got at the front. And it's also quite playful, like turning it into corners. The steering's actually quite crisp and sweet. It's surprisingly easy to place and yet even though it sort of dances around on bumps and isn't really settled, it does feel strong. So on that road from Ivanhoe to Menindee that we drove where the GWM really needed attention as to what was coming before it kind of biffed dips with the front suspension, the DMX kind of dances over that stuff. And by dances, I mean it actually does dance. It sort of bounces around in the tail a bit and skitters around and stuff, but it's all reasonably in rhythm with the dynamics of the car. It actually performs quite well. This LSU spec here, which is $15,000 more than the GWM before on road costs, has manual cloth seats. And I have no issue with that at all because in this heat here, even though this interior is dark, they are still much better at soaking up workers crack, as I shall say because they're just more comfortable. It actually doesn't need to have electric adjustment, although it does have electric lumbar. And the driving position as well, you do sit higher and have a better view, but you don't have that lounging feel that the GWM has. 
once it comes to stuff like off-roading and things like that, the punch of the D-Max's engine, just having a little bit more torque, and also being able to access things that don't require your attention off-road, like pointless steering settings, two of which in the GWM aren't even worth it. You just got one size fits all and that's what works. And in the MY22 D-Max, we have the lane assist just on a button on the right here, which you can hold in and it goes away. Because much like the GWM, the lane assist in the D-Max is also poo. I don't know why these features are on these cars because other than to meet a safety rating because they really are detrimental in many cases in the real world. The other sort of slightly weird thing is that even though the D-Max rolls a lot, it just feels really nicely poised for a dual cab. You wouldn't believe how much fun you get having this, especially compared to that agricultural thing that it replaced, which I really didn't like. This is now a car that is quiet, that is refined, and for the most part is much better than you would expect. About the only area that I can really closely pick on is again this touchscreen here. Even though on Apple CarPlay the buttons are set up for right-hand drive, they're right next to the driver. In the GWM, they're over here on the left, which is the first time I think I've ever noticed that. But here, they all work to good effect, but that screen is hard to see, it's needlessly complex, and it just doesn't work in really bad glare conditions and stuff like that, which is what we're encountering out here on the edge of the outback. The elephant in the room of the Hilux is obviously its price. Like, we're in a Rogue here, which is the top spec car, it's over $70,000, but we could be in an SR5 and that's already over $60,000. And like I mentioned earlier, this is a premium priced car, but with a premium reputation. So you can balance that out however you will. In this Rogue here though, we have a driver's seat with electric adjustment, but we don't have electric adjustment for the front passenger like the GWM has. It doesn't have wireless charging. It has steering reach adjustment, but it's so rudimentary that it moves about that far. And much like the D-Max, you're sitting in a car that's quite, or oh, dual cab, that's quite high, the dash is quite short, the pillars are fairly narrow, you do feel very upright. Where that works absolutely brilliantly is when you're driving off-road. We drove up a very rocky incline last night for scouting photography, and the GWM just wouldn't have been able to get up there. The bonnet is too steep. It wouldn't have been able to see over the front, whereas in the Hilux in particular, you've got this view down. This is about being fit for a purpose. And I think that's what underpins the Hilux in general. It is not a vehicle that does really high highs and is really great at some things. It is just consistently strong and solid at everything. It isn't as playful to drive as the D-Max is, but it has more grunt. It definitely has that. We've measured it from 80 to 120. We did overtaking acceleration in these three units. The Hilux does 80 to 120 in 8.3 seconds. The D-Max did it in 8.6, and the eight-speed GWM did it in 10.4. That's two seconds slower than the Hilux, just because it doesn't have that torque punch that this 500 Newton meter tune has from 1600 RPM in the latest Hilux, that really works. You've also got a power button down here, which makes it just even more insistent in punching that through. And even though I'm saying that it isn't as playful as the D-Max because it doesn't have that steering input off straight ahead, it's just a little bit stodgy, it is really planted in a corner. You can still have fun in it. It's really easy to place. Here we are, just tighter and tighter and tighter. And on dirt, it just, again, like the D-Max, just smashes over stuff, but with a little bit more poise, I suppose. Maybe not so poise in the handling balance, but in terms of being stable and solid and faithful and reliable, and that's what you want. Something that can just bomb over surfaces, point in the right direction, not be slithering and dancing around, even though that is kind of fun in the D-Max, and not having to worry about the front suspension crashing through like you do in the GWM. This is a premium, dual cab and is Australia's default dual cab kind of for a reason. In fact, more than kind of. It is for a reason because it's kind of hard to fault. I think where that lack of sort of spectacular highs really works in the Hilux's favour is in its interior. Even though we're looking at a 2015 design that has very 
minimal delusions of grandeur. This is all rock hard stuff. It is simple and solid and easy to use on the move, on a bumpy road, and that's what it's about. There is a lot of fiddly things about Toyota switch gear. Some of the stuff in the center here that's sort of persistent, constantly bringing up screens, saying that it's refreshing the diesel particulate filter. Can be a little bit annoying. It has some safety things that you've got to turn off as well, but it is easier to turn them off in this than in the GWM. And having the HVAC system, all the ventilation, perhaps not as pretty as the D-Max with its little strip of toggles, but it's all really easy to see and simple. And this solid, simple simplicity without trying too hard with those screens that the GWM has, I think works for a dual cab in Australia. And I might say too that the JBL stereo in this Rogue spec is actually really good. It does look like having two squashed hamburgers on the end of either end of the dash, but it definitely sounds way better than the GWM's and a little bit better than the D-Max's surprisingly good one. So the purpose of this test was twofold. One, can the GWM mute handle going to the outback in Australia? And two, should you save, in this instance, between fifteen and $25,000 in buying a top spec GWM Mute compared to a top spec Hilux or a upper mid Isuzu D-Max? And I feel like that's a difficult question to answer. It is not as all round accomplished as these other two Utes here. These two are better at towing, they have more performance, they feel stronger in their suspension and they're more capable and more well rounded at the things that you expect. But the GWM at 44 and a half drive away is a lot of ute for the money. I feel like Great Wall Motors has actually focused on more of an American pickup in trying to develop its ute than just trying to do another cheaper version of the Japanese utes. It's a very different ute. It has a different flavor about it, and that's actually what makes it pretty good. It's like a lounge room on wheels, and that absolutely does not apply to these two here, especially the Hilux, because its back seat is rubbish compared to the GWMs, which is like being in a bloody Range Rover. But there isn't quite enough performance here. That front suspension is a little bit too soft, although it, you know what, it can handle being pounded along on a dirt road. And that's probably where this feels most fun to drive. Bombing along on a dirt road, full time four wheel drive, stability control, doing a really good job at keeping it in control. And it's actually pretty refined, but it's just not as all round refined as these two. And I suppose at the end of the day, if you're looking at a top spec GWM compared to a top spec Toyota Hilux and you have $25,000 up your sleeve, that buys a lot of aftermarket stuff to make this a whole lot better, especially that grill. If you haven't subscribed, please do so below the video, hit the notification bell and tell us what you think about taking a GWM mute to the Outback or what we think about the Hilux and the D-Max or about chasing cars. Thanks for watching.